The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. Welcome to The David Pakman Show. It's a new week of shows. We'll talk about the last day at the Democratic National Convention. Lewis thinks something's very, very funny over there. You almost lost your mask when we started. You just kind of banged it on the table. I thought that was funny. Oh, gotcha. You know what? We should really turn the volume off on that computer. That seems to be a... <laughs> That seems to be a problem. So we, we may want to do that so we don't get yeah. an infinite loop of feedback. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll talk in the meantime. Uh, next week, we're going to have something very exciting. We did a test one of these last month. It was a video call-in where members were able to uh, call in and talk to us. Lewis was hanging out. It's a new video chat room through Spreecast. Well, we're going to do it again on Monday, next Monday, one week from today, right after the show, 3.15 p.m. as Lewis uh, sneaks around here today. We're going to do another member call in and it's going to be fantastic. So if you're not yet a member, this is the time to sign up. Quarter past 3 p.m. Eastern, next Monday the 17th, all members will be able to call in. We'll all be hanging out here in the studio. We'll take your questions, questions about the show, questions about politics. We'll talk about the election. You must have a webcam to participate. Don't need a webcam just to, uh, to watch and to uh, chat. So that's going to be exciting stuff, Lewis. I'm hoping we get some more questions about your hair. Yeah, there's... well. I've seen that the, co the comments about my hair increase exponentially with how long it's been since I've gotten a haircut. So now we're really getting into a couple of months, and that curve is really starting to accelerate, which is fascinating. Yeah, the, the funny thing is that it actually matches the curve of the front of your hair. It is compelling. It seems to be a, a similar Neil, Neil deGrasse Tyson is going to do an analysis of it. I hope so. Yeah. John Kerry showed up at the Democratic National Convention and basically just started roasting people. It was hilarious. I actually think that even though it's being hugely underreported and underrated, John Kerry's speech at the DNC, I think, was one of the better speeches. It didn't come in the prime time, 10 p.m. hour, but the content was great. He was hilarious. Here's some of the best excerpts from that speech. I just thought he was, he, he was really funny, making fun of himself, making fun of Mitt Romney. Let's take a listen to a little bit of what John Kerry had to say. I learned Mitt Romney doesn't know much about foreign policy, but he has all these neocon advisors who know all the wrong things about foreign policy. <laughs> he would rely on them after all, he's the great outsourcer. But I say to you, this is not the time to outsource the job of commander in chief. The only I really liked it. I mean, I thought he was making good points and, and doing it in a way that was accessible and funny. Let's continue and listen to a little bit more of this. Being exceptional about today's Republicans is that almost without exception, they oppose everything that has made America exceptional in the first place. <laughs> Ask Osama bin Laden if he is better off now than he was four years ago. And what is there on the other side? An extreme and expedient candidate who lacks the judgment and the vision so vital for the Oval Office? The most inexperienced foreign policy twosome to run for president and vice president in decades. <laughs> you know, it isn't, it isn't fair. It isn't fair to say that Mitt Romney doesn't have a position on Afghanistan. He has every position. He, he, was against, he was against setting a date for withdrawal. Then he said it was right. And then he left the impression that maybe it was wrong to leave this soon. He said it was tragic to leave Iraq. And then he said it was fine. He said we should have intervened in Libya sooner. Then he ran down a hallway to run away from the reporters who were asking questions. Then he said the intervention was too aggressive. And then he said the world was a better place because the intervention succeeded. <laughs> Talk about being for it before you were against it. Of course, referring to himself, Lewis, being, told, uh, being called a flip-flopper back in 2004 for having right. an actual nuanced position on ending, you know, saying that horrible line of I was for it before I was against it or vice versa. And then a little bit more, he really was good. Mr. Romney, here's a little advice. Before you debate Barack Obama on foreign policy, you better finish the debate with yourself. For Mitt Romney, an overseas trip is what you call it when you trip all over yourself overseas. <laughs> you know, it wasn't it wasn't a goodwill mission, it was a blooper reel. <laughs> He's even blurted out the preposterous notion 
that Russia is our number one political, geopolitical foe? Folks, Sarah Palin said she could see Russia from Alaska. <laughs> Mitt, Mitt Romney talks like he's only seen Russia by watching Rocky IV. <laughs> So, I mean, he literally went out there and it was like a roast. I was waiting for Jeff Ross to come out and say that it was a, it was a Comedy Central roast of Mitt Romney. I thought he was fantastic. Yeah, yeah, and he did, uh, he did exactly the right thing. It was all just, I mean, smash, slamming a candidate is, is, always, uh, is always the best thing to do. I mean, unfortunately, you know, he, he didn't really talk much about Obama. Um, he didn't tout Obama. He all he did was slam Romney, and it, it's fine. It works, and it was funny. And right, yeah, I mean, he, it was accurate. Okay, and then we got to President Obama, and President Obama, I thought, made a good speech. It was, uh, you know, first we had Bill Clinton out there, very specifically crushing lies that we're hearing from the right wing. Then we had John Kerry roasting Mitt Romney, and then we had President Obama come out and give a good speech, which, by the way, I thought was the right length. I I thought that because of Bill Clinton's long speech, maybe there would be some need to have President Obama make the longest speech, which would have been far too long if he had gone over 48 minutes. I thought he made a good speech, concise, about the right length. He talked about everything from taxes to energy to education to the war, getting bin Laden, budget and spendings, jobs, the war on women. Uh, he said, gay people aren't to blame for our troubles which is an important thing to say when you're actually having Republicans watch because a lot of Republicans think gays are responsible for all our troubles. Yeah, it's pretty sad that you have to state that, but uh, it, it did need to be said. A lot of lies from the RNC he was able to dispel. What will the bounce be? Well, we're already seeing some of it. We'll talk about it a little bit later. You, what, what's your sense, Lewis? We'll talk to Scott Keeter next week. You think there will be a strong bounce from that uh, uh, convention overall? Definitely. And like we talked about before, I think it is uh, a huge benefit to be second uh in terms of when the conventions happen uh i think it's it's all good for the democrats here's a little bit of audio from president obama's speech and if you share that faith with me if you share that hope with me i ask you tonight for your vote if you reject the notion that this nation's promise is reserved for the few, your voice must be heard in this election. If you reject the notion that our government is forever beholden to the highest bidder, you need to stand up in this election. All right, so definitely a lot of Obama-esque stuff. Some people saying, you know, a lot of this sounds similar to what he was saying before the 2008 election, and he really hasn't done very much uh, to, to significantly curb corporate influence and corporate power in politics, and he really hasn't done enough on this and that. And you know what? I completely agree. And at the same time, I'm aware that now we've come to a point where we have two possibilities for who is going to be the next president, and one of them is far worse than the other. And that's why I will be voting for Barack Obama. Mm. My ears are not really going to perk up until I hear Obama say, Three very important words. Do you know what those are? Um, let's see. Read my lips. Campaign finance reform. Oh, okay. All right. I see. Well, listen, um, we'll get back to some of the polling and stuff. A couple other stories I want to talk about. This is an interesting story from over the weekend. NFL football player from the Baltimore Ravens, Brendan Ian Badejo, did a video indicating his support of gay marriage. Okay, this is the video that started it all to give you a sense for what we're talking about. I'm Brendan Ian Badejo a linebacker for the Baltimore Ravens. I believe we should be doing everything that we can to make Maryland families stronger, which is why I support marriage for gay and lesbian couples who want to make a lifetime commitment to each other. People from all walks of life, including gay and lesbian couples, want their children to be in stable homes and protected under the law. Okay, so very clearly, Marylanders support marriage equality join us in support, et cetera, et cetera. Not anything even sanctioned, to be clear, because this is relevant for the story, not anything even sanctioned or promoted by the Baltimore Ravens. So far, so good. That's how it starts, Lewis. Right. Then we get a letter dated August 29th, 2012, addressed to the owner of the Ravens, Steve Biscotti, written by a Democrat from the Maryland House of Delegates named Emmett C. Burns Jr. And he writes, I find it inconceivable 
that one of your players, Mr. Brendan Ian Badejo, would publicly endorse same-sex marriage, specifically as a Ravens football player. Many of my constituents and your supporters are appalled and aghast that a member of the football team would step into this controversial divide and try to sway public opinion. I'm requesting that you take the necessary action as an NFL owner to inhibit such expressions from your employees and that he be ordered to cease and desist such injurious actions. I know of no, one, no other NFL player who has done what Mr. Ian Badejo is doing. So this is fascinating on a number of levels. Number one, by saying that he knows of no other player uh, that has done what he has done, Burns is revealing not only does he not have any idea what's going on in the league and, that the, uh, and with the players, it shows he hasn't even been paying attention to Ian Badejo, who joined the Ravens back in 2008, and he wrote about supporting same-sex marriage on Huffington Post three years ago in 2009. So not only is he not aware, there are other players, and we'll get to them because that's a fascinating part. He seemed to not even really be paying attention to this player's view on gay marriage three years ago. Shows you how, how uh, uh, um, uh, aware this guy is. And he's a Democrat. I don't care what he is. If, if this is the type of thing you're going to say, you have no idea what you're talking about. I don't care about Party Lewis. You know that. Uh, absolutely, yes. It just so happens that usually people like this fall under a certain category. Typically, they're Republicans. This time, it's not. I don't care. This yeah. guy has no idea what he's talking about. So then let's continue. This is actually really potentially a violation of, of uh, freedom of speech because what, what if the NFL football owner, as a result of public pressure from an elected official, decided to tell Brendan Ian Badejo not to do this anymore? That would actually be government using their influence or threat of repercussions to suppress speech. That would really be, for all the last three years of accusations from the right and from the anti-gay fringe about suppression of, of the First Amendment and freedom of speech, this would actually be an example if the NFL owner, Steve Biscotti, were actually to take Mr. Burns' advice. Incredible, though, that yeah. we finally see an example of that, yet the Dr. Laura's, the Chick-fil-A's, wrongly talking about freedom of speech violations. So then what do we have? Then we have Minnesota Vikings punter Chris Cluey. He responds to Mr. Burns in a hilarious letter. I've cleaned it up a little bit. I'll just read a couple of excerpts, and they're fi fantastic. He says, Dear Mr. Eb Emmett C. Burns Jr., I find it inconceivable that you are an elected official of Maryland state government. Your vitriolic hatred and bigotry make me ashamed and disgusted to think that you're in any way responsible for shaping public policy at any level. The views you espouse neglect to consider several, several fundamental key points, which I'll outline for you in great detail. You may want to hire an intern to help you with the longer words, Lewis. Number one, as you suspect, as I suspect, you have not read the Constitution. I would like to remind you that the very first, the very first amendment in the founding document deals with freedom of speech, particularly the abridgment of said freedom, by using your position as an elected official to state that the Ravens should inhibit such expressions from your employees, you are not only clear, you are not only are you clearly violating the First Amendment, you also come across as a narcissistic from And he goes on and on and on and he says, P.S. I've also been vocal as hell about the issue of gay marriage, so you can take your I know of no other NFL player who has done this and shove it in your closed-minded, lacking in empathy pie hole, and choke on it. So I think that the, the Vikings punter was not thrilled with the letter. Is that fair to say, Lewis? I think we can, we can conclude that, yeah. Hilarious stuff. Fantastic that NFL players and really athletes of all kinds are really starting to be more vocal about this, particularly when we've seen a lot of, uh, a, a lot of the fag word thrown around among sports and it's kind of become a colloquialism, not the influence we want to have on young players of any sport who are coming up through the ranks who look at these people as, uh, as role models. Right. I can't think of a better role model for, for the youth. I mean, especially even when your parents at home might be might be saying things that that you're unsure about or using or happen to be bigots themselves and then you see someone you admire who uh is saying the opposite obviously that can be a very good thing no question about it let's get to today's rec uh, book recommendation every monday i recommend a book i've got a good one for you now we have to mention i've talked to lewis about how we're going to have the cover of the book up on the screen instead of cartoony drawings of books yes but we're, we're working on that i know it could take a couple months to get that set up right natan Sorry, what? Exactly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so today's book recommendation is always made possible in part by A Fashion of Bastards, the best-selling satirical forecast 
by Joanna Louise Johnson. You can find it on Amazon.com called Utterly Hilarious, Foreboding, and Entertaining. This one might be one that people haven't heard of. It's by an author called Chu Xiaolong. Now, the first name is Q-I-U. I'm told it's pronounced Chu as opposed to Q. The book is The Mao Case, and I've read a bunch of uh, uh, Xiaolong's books. They're kind of like murder, mystery, crime, fiction. They all take place in or surrounding China or Chinese culture. They're very entertaining. Not only are they well written as murder mysteries, but you get a ton of Chinese culture uh, uh, built in. Very, very entertaining. The Mao Case by Chu Xiaolong, this week's book recommendation. You should read that one, Lewis. I might have to do that. We've got a great bonus show today. If you don't get the bonus show, become a member. DavidPackman.com slash membership. We'll take a, b a break. A lot more stories coming up, Lewis. Stay tuned. The David Pakman Show at DavidPackman.com. Welcome back to The David Pakman Show. Welcome back to The David Pakman Show. An easy, free way to support the show is to do all of your Amazon.com shopping through the black banner at davidpakman.com. You click it once, you bookmark it, you use that link every time you shop. Uh, very, very much appreciated. Also, today, saying hi to a very special new David Pakman Show member, made possible in part by liberalbias.com. Some people say that conservatives are anti-science, but have you ever stopped to think that maybe science itself is anti-conservative? You can find out more about that at liberalbias.com. Today's new member of the day, Robert Knight. Robert Knight, who is uh, one of the Knights of the Round Table of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Isn't that right, Lewis? You're combining all sorts of things there. <laughs> yes, well, that, uh, that happens. Very creative. So thanks very much to Robert Knight and to all new David Pakman Show members. You can sign up on our website, davidpakman.com. Let's talk about a Republican congressional candidate, Danny Tarkanian, running in Nevada, who is accusing a black opponent of only pretending to be black. Now, if you've never heard of congressional candidate Danny Tarkanian, that's okay. Hopefully you never will again. He's running against black Democrat Stephen Horsford, and he's saying Horsford is, uh, uh, Horsford is pretending to be black. He says... We could be like Stephen Horsford, who's not doing anything with that community, and you know, pretend we're black and maybe try to get some votes if that's where it is. It's that extent that they're going to. By they, I assume he means black people or Democrats. I don't even know. Uh, or, or his opponent's campaign. I, I don't know. In a later interview, Tarkanian fired back saying, um, obviously, or he, he kind of backtracked, obviously I made an inarticulate statement that is being misconstrued right now. What I meant to say is, it's clear that Mr. Horsford has ignored the community in the time he's been a state senator and he can't expect to get votes from there. I love it when the apology or the clarification refers to a misunderstanding that's impossible to believe, right? It's like if uh, somebody were to come on the show during an interview and say, David Pakman is a dirty Jew. And then the explanation is, listen, I made an inarticulate comment. It's being misconstrued. What I meant to say is that David Pakman's cooking skills are mediocre at best. And then he said, what, what on earth is that? I, I actually think that that is what he meant. Uh, in, in other words, uh, his, his, <laughs> what he said was absurd, obviously. It's kind of like the Stephen Colbert line. He's judging a person's skin color, not by the color of his skin, but by the content of his character. But I think clearly this is what he meant. If you look at the context, he's saying the guy isn't a, a black candidate, meaning a person who's serving the interests of the black community. The, I, the, then the question would be, that there, why is there an assumption that to be a so-called, in other words, if you're a white candidate, it's very, very rare that people are going to come out and debate whether or not you actually serve white interests. This is only even a topic because the guy is black, and there's an assumption from the right that black candidates typically serve the interests of the black people, Look, when, and this guy is not even doing that, right? I mean, it's Many a, it's a people, narrative. including in the black community, called Clinton the first black president for this very reason. That, that has nothing to do with this story, though. It's about calling someone a black 
politician, bec not because of their skin color, but because they're serving the interests of the black community. It's the same thing. It's not even really what he's saying. And he's even dancing around it because exactly he's not even he's talking about the black community. He's using euphemisms. He's talking about the community, his community, that, that community. Lewis. I understand the point Natan's trying to make. I just think in this case, the combination of the, the, the uh, 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 a shady language that the guy's using to even refer to black people and the fact that the context is when we have a black Democrat, you have to talk about whether or not they can be trusted to care about anybody other than black people. It's, it's a racist structure is what I'm pointing but out Dave, here. He's clearly, if you look at the context, talking about the black voters shouldn't vote for him because he's not really a candidate that's serving their interests. It's totally obvious. I, I disagree with the, the distinction Natan's trying to draw here. I think it's a good point. I just think in this particular case, you're ignoring the context and the long track record. Lewis, what do you think? I'm not 100% on, uh, on what he's trying to say here. It is perfectly possible that he is, he is saying what Natan stated. But I know that you're, you're trying to make the point that this statement shouldn't even exist and only exists because of uh, because of a racist uh i don't know undertone Under possibly. possibly let's let's pause on this one because i have a couple other black related stories to talk about email me let me know what you think another story from our friend lou college Giovanni over at the examiner and the we survive bush you survive obama uh, facebook page a republican senator says he doesn't give a rat's ass what black people think <laughs> that's a, let's see if we can mince words on this one republican jim somerville who's a first term senator state senator from dixon tennessee is joining the chorus of tone-deaf conservatives. It was found that in an official email, the senator said he didn't care what black people thought, specifically what the representatives in the black caucus thought. The comments were made by Summer Somerville, who was at the time heading an investigation by the Senate into a possible scandal at Tennessee State University, which allegedly involved students' grades being fixed. Now, TSU is a world-renowned black university, it was perfectly reasonable for members of the Black Caucus to contact Somerville with questions about this investigation that he's doing, don't you think? Naturally, yeah. What was unreasonable, though, is that Somerville's conduct was very, very bizarre. It was reported by the Tennessean that Somerville specifically wrote, I don't give a rat's ass what the Black Caucus thinks. The message was sent using the subject line of, please share this response with your colleagues. Very, very nice, Lewis. I like this one. Hmm. Go on. He's, of course, been removed as the chairman. Actually, I shouldn't say, of course. He, what should happen, which is that he was removed from the, uh, as chairman of the Higher Education Subcommittee, did happen. And he may be penalized further. What's your reaction to this one, Natan? Yeah, this one pretty much speaks for itself. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it, it, but it's, I just want to state that this is completely different from the first example, despite the fact that both have to do with racist comments about black people. It should be is, noted. Is it possible that he just meant... Uh, what these specific representatives think right yeah maybe he did <laughs> is that any better if you don't care what other states and other representatives say then you probably are still in trouble here's something funny on linkedin it says that somerville has published a book titled educating black doctors <laughs> <laughs> this is the guy we want this isn't really news in the specific sense that the republican party has been filled with guys like this for a really long time hmm. so First term and hopefully last term. Lastly, Rush Limbaugh opens his mouth, inserts his foot. Now he's claiming President Obama is not authentically black. We have audio from the Rush Limbaugh show. Let's listen. Give me this down with the struggle business. He wasn't, he wasn't down with the struggle. That's the whole point. If you go back to 2008, the Democrats were wringing their hands because he wasn't authentically black. That's the reason the Reverend Sharp got a problem with him, and, and they, they, they wrote the column in the L.A. Times of the Magic Negro. <laughs> he wasn't down with the struggle. He doesn't have slave blood. You know all that. You're the official Obama criticizer. What are you telling me? All right. He doesn't have slave blood. So this is funny because, number one, the idea that if you don't come from slaves, you're not black is absurd. But number two, as found by the genealogist on Ancestry.com, not only is President Obama descended from slaves, one of his ancestors is the first documented slave, John Punch, which was revealed by the New York Times. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the president is not authentically black. What's Rush Limbaugh talking about at this point? And what's he trying to do? First, he's not white enough. Now he's not black enough. It's, it's brilliant. Now, I do have something to say about this. I'm not going to defend what Rush said. However, if he had used the term African-American instead of black, he's not, he does, let's say he didn't have 
an ancestor that was a slave. Right. You could make the case he doesn't have the same shared history in his ancestry that other African Americans have. I'm not saying that. So that's let's clarify. Good or bad or in other words, what Natan is saying is, if Rush Limbaugh had said something different, and if President Obama's uh, family background was different. No, no, no. It's then totally, there may be something to it. No, 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 no. It. Incredible, it's totally, guys. We're really, that, what a great, great you're statement. Not, you, you're not seeing the point I'm making. Yeah. It's totally incidental that, in fact, Obama has a slave ancestor. <laughs> it could have easily not been the case, and that wouldn't, made you, that wouldn't have made you say anything different just now. No, so, because, because Rush Limbaugh, let's be honest. I mean, let's talk frankly, guys, here. We're not here to wordsmith and play semantic arguments. Rush Limbaugh is talking about something else. Rush Limbaugh is talking about what the right stereotype is of someone who is really a black person, right? That's what's at the bottom of this. Yeah, I think so. Natan? Yeah. yeah, however, it was the case that in 2008 during the campaign, there were African Americans who were making the same argument. Okay, uh, you, you know, just because uh, the same way that I'll criticize a Democrat for being anti-gay, just because a black person says something about black people doesn't mean that they're the ultimate, uh, 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 the, the high and mighty authority on it, right? I mean, what I'm saying is these people, and one of them appeared on the Stephen Colbert show and he ripped them apart, which I quoted earlier. This was actually something that some people talked about. He doesn't share our history. He's not like us. He has the same skin color, but he's, he doesn't have the same cultural history. I'm not saying that's the case. I'm just saying people said that. Yeah. Uh, okay. In no, reality, I, I he agree does with Natan. have the same history. In reality, he does. And I agree with Natan that some people did say that. That's a, yeah. that's a statement of fact. And let's just be clear that only Al Sharpton and Jesse Jackson are, are the supreme authorities on, on if you're authentically black enough. <laughs> Let's take a break. A lot more stuff to talk about, including new polls, a new David meme image, and uh, you're not going to believe it. What percentage of people of, of Ohio Republicans do you think credit Mitt Romney with the Osama bin Laden raid? You'll be surprised. Stay tuned. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. Welcome back to The David Pakman Show. Welcome back to the show. A great free way to support The David Pakman Show. Donate a Twitter or Facebook message to The David Pakman Show through Donate Your Account. Go to DonateYourAccount.com slash David Pakman Show. Takes a second. Big help to the show. Okay, let's go through a couple things that were sent to me. I got a David meme style picture sent to me by Jacob Silva. This is it. Now, you may not be able to read it. It would be great if we could put this up full screen, Natan. But anyway, it's a picture of me which says has something important to tell you, and then at the bottom, but first let's talk about signing up for my website. So, you know, I think this is funny. Yes, we pitch membership and such on the show. The reality is the alternative is a very sad alternative, ladies and gentlemen. It's a taking money from Exxon. It's taking, it's essentially taking money from oil companies. That's exactly based, but the long and short of it is that's the alternative. So I'm glad to put these up. I think this is hilarious. Send in more memes. You know, when we had the Lewis memes, we put those up. No big deal. I can take the joke. But the reality is, Lewis, not to turn this into a pitch, if we didn't have the pitches for membership, which is how we are funded, we probably wouldn't be on the air or we'd be on in an incredibly corporate setting, which, which would be sad. Yeah. Um, Jacob, let's just, let's just turn the bottom. Instead of signing up for my website, just change that to membership program. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. because it's a, let's at least make it factually accurate. But very, very funny from Jacob Silva. So keep sending these in. Also, Stuart Shea sent one in called David Pony. And I guess let's put that one up on the screen. I guess that's a reference to, is it My Little Pony, Lewis? I guess. Yeah, that's that's it's a cartoon show. Which incredibly, I was hearing on the Howard Stern show that there's a lot of older people who like My Little Pony. They just they love My Little Pony. I, I don't understand that exactly. I in preparation for the show, I just put it up on YouTube and looked at a couple clips. I'm not finding it that compelling, but you know, it's pretty disturbing. Let's put up now for comparison. Let's put up the picture of Lewis Pony, which we have here as well. There it is. I don't know if Lewis Pony is the guy or if it's the horse, but it's a com it's a disturbing image, needless to say. I'm pretty sure neither one of those uh, is me in any <laughs> way, shape, or form. No, it's obviously the horse in the picture that is Lewis Pony. Uh, if you're missing this, if you're just listening, make sure to check it out on uh, on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Or are we dealing with like fairy anthropy here? <laughs> and, and do I can I turn into a horse? No. Let's move on to talk about some polling information. Um, before the uh, Republican National Convention, just about every day. Let's change the picture, guys. Why don't we? Because it is quite distracting. 
Um, that's the wrong picture too. I don't know. I don't know why we now have a picture of Osama bin Laden. Very, very strange. Um, but I'm sure we're going to get it fixed. Before we went into the RNC, Drudge Report and other conservative websites daily were posting in big news headlines: Romney 48, Obama 44. Okay. I log on a couple days after the Democratic National Convention to Drudge Report, and what do I see? Obama 49, Romney 44. But now we have all of these lines below Lewis that say, but Carter was plus four over Reagan, but Michael Dukakis was also plus 17. So now immediately the theme changing on the Republican side from Romney is leading the polls to Obama is leading, but historically we find two examples where it's meaningless. So really, Romney's going to win anyway. Very funny what's going on with the polling, Lewis, right now. Yeah. Uh, you know I'm not a fan of polls. No, I mean, of course it, it not. Really, nor of voting. I mean, I, I, he's but those literally two, not a fan of polling. Those are two separate movie. issues. Okay. They're two separate issues. Like you're not fa a fan of, of participating in polls or you're not a fan of reading polls? Uh, I'm not a, a fan of uh, claiming the polls are accurate. Gotcha. Yeah. Now, interestingly enough, to look specifically, there was an interesting uh, poll done in Ohio. And this is, this is just bizarre. This was done by, um, pub, by PPP, which is public policy polling. They asked, who do you think deserves the credit for the successful Osama bin Laden raid that led to his death, to his killing? 15% of Ohio Republicans said that it's actually Mitt Romney <laughs> that deserves the credit for that raid. Now, I, have, I understand what many of you will say, which is, if you give people that option and they're Republicans and they can, they can answer in a way that will just do something negative to Barack Obama, they're going to do it so that it's not really a valid result. What do you guys think of that? I think, I think people are just doing this because they can. Because <laughs> it was given as an option. It was given as an option and they're like, what the hell? I support Romney. I'm going to give him, I'm going to say that he deserves credit. Fine. Let's put that one aside for a second. 47% of people answered that question by saying they're actually unsure whether Obama or Romney deserve credit. Now that's much stranger. That is very bizarre. What do you think of this poll, Natan? Um, I, I think that it clearly shows that uh, the mass of voters, uh, Republican registered voters, uh, have no idea what's going on, just like the party, uh, their own party's rhetoric. The big news in the poll, honestly, putting aside the funny 15% thing about Osama, is that Obama is now ahead of Mitt Romney by five percentage points in Ohio, which is now outside of the margin of error. No Republican has ever won the presidency, as far as I can recall, without winning Ohio. Do you concur on that, Natan? Well, it's not a question of opinion. It's either true or not true. I just don't uh, remember if it's ever or in the last, like, I, I years. think it's in the last certain amount of time. Okay. Here's a reality check on the state of the presidential race. A number of different polling gurus, including Nate Silver from the New York Times and 538, who is controversial in some ways, and we'll talk about that on, on Wednesday's show, is now saying that President Obama has an 80% chance of winning re-election, which is pretty substantial, I would say. Yeah, when you look at just one poll, it's easy to dismiss. But, I mean, collectively, the polls seem to be indicating that uh, Romney's all done. Obama is terrible for the economy. You'll hear Republicans say uh, that also came on the heels of his uh, DNC speech, which happened to be the same day that stock markets surged to their highest point in years. Of course, Obama is terrible for corporate profits, which are an all-time high, and for uh, the stock market. And if it's not filtering down to jobs, then you've just proven that trickle-down economics don't work. At least some people are doing well. Mitt Romney on Obamacare. He now is saying... I'm not going to get rid of all of health care reform. This is funny. The guys flip-flopped so many times. Of course, we had repeal and replace, and then we, had, uh, then we had this. Let's take a listen to what he had to say on Meet the Press just yesterday. Obamacare, and I'm replacing it with my own plan. I'm not getting rid of all of health care reform. Of course, there are a number of things that I like in health care reform that I'm going to put in place. One is to make sure that those with pre-existing conditions can get coverage. Two is to assure that the marketplace allows for individuals to have policies that cover their, their family up to whatever age they might like. Okay, uh, so this is fascinating because, okay, at level one, we have the incredible Mitt Romney flip-flopping that is constant. Just today, 24 hours after going on and saying that, a Romney aide told the National Review that Romney actually doesn't support the Affordable Care Act's ban on discriminating against people with pre-existing conditions, even though on Meet the Press, he suggested that's one of the parts that he would keep. So here's what we have for Mitt Romney. First, 
he is responsible for Romney care, which is used as a significant basis for Obamacare. Then he says, well, yeah, but I wouldn't want to do that at the federal level. I would repeal and replace Obamacare. Then he goes back and he says, well, hold on a second. I wouldn't actually get rid of everything that Obamacare does, but I would still repeal and replace, except some of the things I would replace it with are things that are already in there, which are, of course, based on Romney care, which I originally passed in Massachusetts. And then now this morning back to, well, 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 don't go too far. Even though I said the pre-existing conditions thing was one of the things I would keep, I'm actually not going to do that either. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. He only talks, uh, the only things he mentions are the things he's going to keep. And right. those are the things that the population that the general populace likes the most about uh, the Affordable Health Care Act. And once it gets and enacted, he, yeah. all these things are going to be liked by the general populace. There's, it will be impossible to repeal this. I think there's something else to be said about this, which is that if he keeps the pre-existing conditions provision in the law and repeals the mandate, the whole law makes no sense, and no that will result in much higher health care costs. Let's talk about it financially. That's a good point, Natan. Mandating coverage of pre-existing conditions is going to be a net increase in cost for the insurance company. Why? Because you're being mandated to take on people that inevitably, looking at the numbers, are going to incur more costs, more claims over their lives. You need to counter that somehow. And that was being done by, by the individual sure everyone is buying healthcare. individual health care mandate, which you're, you're giving 30 million new customers to the for-profit insurance companies. You can't get rid of one and keep the other. It would, it would actually be what Republicans always worry about, which is an unsustainable financial situation. It just wouldn't work. Right. I well, tell you what Romney should do. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. If I were a Romney advisor, I'd tell him to repeal the entire law, pass it with the exact same provisions, and just call it Romney Care. There you go. Okay, real quick. A Florida Republican has picked up the president at a rally. Literally, this is Scott Van Duzer. He's a uh, registered Republican. He did vote for Obama in 2008. Definitely is going to vote for Obama in 2012. Let's take a look at this video. And what, what's happening is Obama shows up and Scott Van Duzer just gets so excited. He literally uh, deadlifts President Obama. Let's take a look at this. Literally off the ground today by a pizzeria owner yeah, in Florida as he continues to swing through Say this right. state right there. Pizzeria. Uh, the president walked into the restaurant during a campaign stop. Big and up he hug, goes. And then Interesting that stuff. bear hug right there. Apparently not caring right much about uh, standard presidential uh, decorum. To, in his, to his credit, President Obama didn't seem too worried about it, and uh, Secret Service didn't shoot the guy. <laughs> Everyone wins. Lewis hasn't ever picked up a president, but um, he did once pick up a Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court justice like a baby and rocked them back and forth. <laughs> but you that never have so deadlifted. ridiculous. You've never deadlifted a president, though, right? That is like a thousand times <laughs> more ridiculous than any uh, fake situation you've created involving me. All right, let's take a break. Still a couple more stories to talk to you about. Stay tuned. Hi to everyone watching live on YouTube. Of course, we're live on YouTube Monday through Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern. Tune in, and we'll talk to you after the break. Stay tuned. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. Welcome back to The David Pakman Show. The number one way to support the show is by becoming a David Pakman Show member. Instead of being funded by big corporations, we're funded mostly by individual subscribers. You'll get the bonus show, of course, hosted by producer Louis Motomedy. What else do you get, Louis? You'll get our live video member call-ins, which we're having on next Monday at 3.15 p.m. Eastern time. You'll also get a commercial-free audio and video stream of the show and a number of other great things. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a hell of a package. It is. You, it's you a big effing it. deal. It is. Thank you, Lewis. This is an incredible story. Do you remember where you were? I remember because I was in the same place. When the O.J. Simpson double murder verdict was read? Yeah, that was a long time ago. We, yeah. were, we were in school. We were in sixth grade, and I remember an announcement coming over the loudspeaker saying, the butterfly flies free, which was the code that had been agreed upon by the... The faculty. Uh, by the, 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 uh, is it called faculty at an elementary school? by the, teach the teachers, that that would be the code if O.J. Simpson was found not guilty. Now, it's been about 17 years. And now, remember Christopher Darden, the prosecutor, one of the prosecutors? He's now saying that he believes that an O.J. Simpson attorney 
probably Johnny Cochran, may have tampered with that infamous glove. Now, the glove, of course, you'll remember, is the glove, the bloodstained glove that O.J. Simpson was forced to, was asked to try on during the trial, which just did not fit quite right. Now, Christopher Darden, who was the uh, de deputy district attorney back during that case, said on a, um, on a PACE, at a PACE law school discussion about the trial that he believes Johnny Cochran had access, that the defense had access to the glove during the lunch hour, and that Johnny Cochran or someone may have torn the lining in order to make it so that the glove couldn't get all the way on. Now, Alan Dershowitz, who was advising the defense team at the time, came up and said, listen, um, the, uh, uh, the defense does not get access, unsupervised access to evidence like that. This didn't happen. This is all related to Christopher Darden making one of the, uh, he called it the, the greatest legal blunder of the 20th century, which is to have O.J. Simpson try that glove on without having any idea of whether it would fit or wouldn't fit, especially given the fact that even if it wasn't tampered with, the fact that it had been soaked with blood at one point and then allowed to dry could have constricted it anyway, and that alone could have made it appear not to fit. A right. big mistake. Oh, yeah. What do you think about this? I'm interested in now, after the fact, the prosecution and defense attorneys, their thoughts on this. It just doesn't sound that viable. How did the defense team get unsupervised access to the glove and were able to tear it? I don't get it. Yeah. Um, it doesn't make much sense. I don't know what he's trying to do. Isn't O.J. Simpson in jail right now anyway? O.J. Simpson is in jail because in 97 he was found, uh, or no, I'm sorry, in 2007 he was found guilty of armed robbery, which he claimed was to recover his own sports memorabilia. He's serving up to 33 years in prison. Yeah. So uh, why does this even matter? I well, mean, is, I he, is he just trying to, to make it seem like uh, he wasn't incompetent? It's interesting. I don't know why. I mean, in other words, this was just something that Pace Law School does to review old cases, and this is what came out of it, and it's actually pretty, pretty compelling. Do you think that there's anything to the theory that the glove was manipulated? No. All right. You've Matan? heard it from Lewis. Uh, yeah. Can we even hear him? Yeah, you can hear me now. Uh, I have no idea. I mean, uh, it seems like the, the assistant DA or whoever this guy was, the prosecutor, is just trying to cover his losses. All right. What do you think? Let me know. Let me know via voicemail, 2192-DAVID-P. Here's a couple of voicemails that came in. One is from the Eggman. Let's take a listen. Hi, guys. I just saw Joe Biden's speech, and I just want to say he wasn't eating anything, and there were no F-bombs, so he aced it, and that's basically all he had to do. Thanks a lot for all you guys do. Have a great night. Oh, David, do you know the difference now between a swag bag and a swag bag? I hope so. No more swag. Okay, so that was like, it, it, when we were talking about the swag bag with Luke Vargas last week that Republicans were handing out at the DNC, I called it a swag bag, which is, of course, something, uh, swag, something different altogether. And also one voicemail on Sandra Fluke. Hi, David and Lewis and Nathan. Um, this is Mark from Orlando. I was just commenting on your comment about Sandra Fluke speaking at the uh, convention. And actually, I thought that what was more important was not the fact that Rush Limbaugh had said things about her, but also the fact that she had been one of the people who was scheduled to speak about the importance of birth control at the congressional hearing, and she was barred from the congressional hearing. Okay, uh, so I've, I've heard this from enough people since I made those comments that I, I, I have been somewhat swayed. In, the, in other words, it's true. Really, the issue was her, her speech was suppressed. That's really the issue, and that's a valid reason to have her be allowed to speak. However, it, in the public eye, mo more people know about the Rush Limbaugh comments than they do about that. And I'm sure a lot of people just had no idea who she was in general. That too. And on Chuck Norris doing a commercial where he says there will be a thousand years of darkness if President Obama is reelected, I used to think Chuck Norris was a decent guy, what with Walker and all of the memes. It made him look like even though he's this apparent badass, he's still a pretty nice guy. I can't look at him the same way, knowing that he's a deluded member of the God Squad who publicly wants to take away his own wife's marital rights. Maternal rights. Uh, maternal rights. And a thousand years of darkness? That sounds like my experience watching any Chuck Norris film. And lastly, I guess freedom means fascist corporate theocracy for that Jesus cultist. Well, we know freedom has very, very different meanings. Well, uh, depending on uh, whether you're on the, the uh, conservative side of things or not. And, and for example, the freedom to marry whoever you love, that's not really a freedom that the right thinks you should have, Lewis. No, no, that is something that uh, you need to check out the Bible on and, and make sure you're educated.
On today's bonus show, we'll talk about a beverage worker tied down and forced to watch porn and have strippers in his office. Was Lewis there? Was Lewis one of the strippers? We'll find out about all that stuff. Also, PETA losing a Kansas State Fair lawsuit. What's that all about? Get the bonus show. You know you want to see what's going on there. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com.